forge your inner armor. Welcome to the Inner Armor Podcast with Dr. Timothy Royer, where we explore ways to train our brains and bodies to become dynamically resilient so that we can all, from professional athletes to ordinary people, perform at our potential. Well, welcome to the podcast. I'm here with Dr. Royer. Doc, say hi. Yeah. Hey, Greg. How y'all doing out there today? I'm doing pretty good. You were just yeah. telling me you're, uh, it's a beautiful day where you are. There's some yes. boats on the river and life is good. Yeah. I'm in Jacksonville and uh, looking over the St. John's River up on the 14th floor here and uh, just gorgeous. Boats out, calm, wonderful day. We're about Eight days out from my son's wedding, so oh that's gosh. exciting. The all the kids are uh, flying in from all over. Actually, one from Amsterdam's flying in to right. tomorrow, and oh, it's going to be really fun. We we yeah. can't wait, can't wait. So uh, that's uh, yeah, about eight days away. That's super fun. I went through that about six months ago. And I mean, for weeks, it's just a totally immersive experience. Yes. And so you want to really fully engage with that, with the people and the yes. events and the things and be completely 100% immersed in it, which is why we're recording a couple episodes today so I can cut you loose for a few weeks and you yeah. can really immerse yourself in where you are, which brings us to the topic for the day, Man, uh, which is perfect. It does not right? time this. That's right. Yes. I kind of figured this out. So, uh, so, you know, how do we be fully engaged? So let me kind of set this up, the conversation today, and I'm really okay. curious to hear your thoughts. So in previous episodes, we've talked a lot about what it means to thrive as a human being, human thriving, human flourishing. And we've also talked about presence, what it means and the value of being present, and also uh, the value of, of what we've called, you've called coming to your senses which is paying attention using your sensory inputs to what's going on around you. So we've had a lot of rich conversations about that. We've talked about some of it in the book and on some of the videos that we've done. But it seems to me, and we said this in the book, that a pretty good formula for success in life is to be where you need to be, doing what you need to be doing, when you need to be doing it, with whom you need to do it, and when you need to be doing it. Yes. So basically staying uh -huh. on task where you are, we're doing what you got to do. That's a great way to be successful in life. However, I think there's a deception or a self-deception we can fall into, which is that we can be somewhere without actually, you know, being there, right? right. So we're physically present with people. We're, we're physically at work. We're physically with our spouse. We're physically with our children. But we're not really there, right? You can be with people without actually being with them. You're kind of just going through the motions without really paying attention or engaging. And so the challenge is not just to physically be there, but to really engage with where you are and what you're doing and who you're doing it with, which you're going to do in the next couple of weeks here with all of your family coming in for the wedding. So let's talk about that today. Let's talk about being fully engaged with where you are, who you're with, and what you're doing. Yeah, that's spot on. And uh, with this, I think we need to just start with what we talk about a lot is downstream versus upstream. So I can be, you can have two people in the same situation, and one is fully engaged, fully present, because the upstream, neurological, physiological, down to psychological, to emotional behavior is all connected in a balanced way. Or you can have somebody in the exact same situation. They're there, they're for the same amount of time, but they're disengaged because upstream, the system is in chaos. And you can desire all you want to be, to be present or connected to your senses. But if your upstream activity is out of balance, your neurological first, the physiological, your cardiovascular, your your respiratory, your hormones, your sleep patterns, you just can't downstream be engaged. It's just not going to happen. Um, you have to have the upstream under control. And that's where we really need to focus on is before I come to this behavior of being present, 
with people. I have to look up stream and what am I doing prior to this event ever occurring that enables me to activate this upstream to downstream to be able to be fully engaged. You know, it's interesting because I think most of us can relate to being preoccupied. We've got something on our mind. So we're sitting in a meeting, we're talking to somebody, you know, while we're talking to them, we're fiddling with our phone or maybe we're on the phone with them and we're just kind of preoccupied. We're doing the uh uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, Mm -hmm. uh uh-huh. We're not really listening, right? But I think, yeah, you know, what, what you're saying is that it goes far deeper than that. And in fact, the preoccupation may be a downstream behavior of where the brain is. Absolutely. So I know you and I were saying before we started the recording that we both got up and went for our morning walks this morning. I went walk my dog a few miles out here by the lake and it was a great morning, but I was up kind of late, later than normal last night working on some stuff. And, you know, I've got a lot going on today and some things I'm trying to figure out. So I'm walking the dog this morning and I'm on beautiful, you know, beautiful spring morning with the trees and the birds and the dog and the whole bit. But my brain is kind of racing yeah. as I'm walking along. And I, I know enough from, you know, I've learned enough from you that what's going on here is not just preoccupation, but that if I were to put an EEG on, my brain is running faster than it should run for a morning dog walk. And because of that, I can feel stress in myself. I can feel tension mm-hmm. in myself. I can feel these kinds of things. So that upstream thing of our brain racing robs us, as you're saying, of presence. Absolutely. It, there's a, a practice or a discipline of dealing with the upstream. I have this uh, gentleman who did an a interview with me a number of years ago, very well-known guy, and he's talking about how his life changed through the breathing and the heart rate and the uh, EEG work that we do, these upstream changes. And in there, he says, he says this quote I love, he says, you know, your life's going 100 miles an hour, you're going go, 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 go. And uh, three days of vacation is not going to take care of that. You know, and that's kind of like programmed into us, like we're this robot, right? Like I can just like, okay, I'm going to turn off the switch and, you know, go on a long weekend and I come back and now I'm ready to go. And he had come to the realization that until he worked on these hardcore upstream things for months, you know, years, actually, I think of how long he trained these things, that then he developed this new normal where he really could be present. So he almost like, it's the will to prepare to be present. It's not just, I'm going to be present right now. You can't do that if you haven't prepared your nervous system and the downstream systems that respond to your nervous system. So what my brain is doing, you know, it, it's over all the systems and uh, it operates all those. And if that brain is not operating at the right speed, everything else physiologically is going to be out of kilter. So if the brain is going fast, it's not that the car, the heart is going to go slow. No, the heart is going to be going fast. And the respiratory system is going to be going fast. And the digestive system is not going to be working effectively. And the immune system is going to be off. And the HP axis, HPA axis is going to be overactivated. And this is going on continuously. And then all of a sudden you have this quiet moment with somebody and you're expecting that your behavior that you're going to be able to be present, you can't be because neurologically you have this habitual pattern of being in sympathetic, which is in this fast mode, or you live in this world of, I call it the pendulum, where you go fast, 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 crash. Right. Fast, 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 crash. And all you know is you're the person who walks in and says, I've had this happen so many times with couples where You know, the wife is having a little problem sleeping and she says, well, he doesn't have any problem sleeping because when we get in bed in two minutes, he's asleep. And I actually point out that's actually a problem. It should take you about nine to 18 minutes to fall asleep. And anything under seven minutes is a sleep latency disorder, meaning you are so fatigued that your body isn't in rhythm it's crashing because you're going so hard all the time that the body goes into parasympathetic and now you can't engage because you're going too slow. So this happens in the middle of the day, three o'clock, you are like just limp, you know, walking around. You're like a, just a, you can't even move, you know, because you're so tired and then you get a bunch of caffeine and jack yourself back up again and then you crash again. And so 
the key to all of this, you can't talk about presence without talking about where are you before that moment ever happens? Like, what are you doing with the nervous system? You know, so one of the things I'm hearing from you is that you can't snap out of it, right? So whether you're at work and your colleague or your boss or whatever says, hey, pay attention, snap out of it. You go, hey, I'm sorry, I'm a little distracted today. We'll snap out of it. Well, it isn't just an act of will to snap out of it. If the brain and the autonomic nervous system and then the organs and systems downstream from that that are controlled by, you know, that HP axis, when those things are running fast, running hot, you can't just choose to snap out of it. Now, you may, like you say, take a Red Bull, shot of coffee, and then, you know, you'll see somebody like physically, they'll kind of like lean forward and try to like, I'm going to pay attention now. And, and if you've ever been with that person or you've ever been in that place yourself, you go for about 30 seconds, they're with you. They're yes, like, and you can okay, see it on their face. Yeah. And they're like, you see right on their face. They're like, okay, I'm here. All right. So, uh, review. Yeah. And they're like, uh huh, uh huh. And they're like, for about 30, 45 seconds, they're like, uh huh, uh huh. Yep. Got it. Got it. And then about a minute later, you can start to see their eyes sort of drift and wander. Right. And they kind of look at their phone again because it can't snap out of it. Exactly. Because they're not, they're not ever into the presence. You know, they're not ever into that, that middle speed, that optimal speed of the brainwave activity or the heart and cardiovascular, which will, uh, you know, talk about in a, in a few minutes here. But you have to be able to be ready for that because it takes energy to be present. Okay. It takes energy. I, I know this firsthand because as a psychologist, you know, right out of, uh, after my experience at the hospital, I developed a practice and, you know, I was doing therapy, you know, hour after hour after hour. You want to know, I mean, I do all kinds of stuff physically and working and that kind of stuff. The most exhausting thing that I've ever experienced in my life is doing therapy. To do therapy well with somebody for 50 minutes is exhausting. If you are going to truly listen and try to understand the emotions they're experiencing and the traumas they're experiencing and really be present and walk through that with them as a therapist, not all therapists do that. They kind of have their own agenda many times, so it's not as exhausting. But to truly listen and engage my senses with somebody takes energy. And if I've used my energy before I've ever even gotten into that situation, just spinning on things because I can't stop the thoughts from bouncing into my brain. I have what's called monkey brain, where it's just one thing to another. Yes, I'm only going to last about 20 seconds before, wow, I'm off to something else, right? Right. Well, yeah, I mean, in in a sense, I don't want to say it's work, but it's work. You you know, like you think about, like we all have so many, however you want to think of it, units of energy in us when we wake up in the morning. And part of life is figuring out how you're going to spend those, yes. right? And have the wisdom to go, I'm going to go through my day and I know how to sort of spend, you know, the eight units or 20 units or whatever of energy I've got that day, right? And there's certain things that are going to be depleting of that energy. And there's certain things that are going to give you energy. And sort of balancing that or managing that energy load throughout your day. So for some people who are, you know, maybe more introverted, being in meetings and engaging in, with, with people can cost them more, right? But then you got to go, okay, well, if I've got an hour, like you say, of therapy, or I've got three hours of board meetings or committee meetings or just managing people, I can't come into that, as you're saying, already spun up and having already used a bunch of my energy. And if I've stayed up, I haven't slept well the night before, right? Because my brain yep. is spinning and I wake up in the morning and my brain is spinning and I'm running high beta in my, in my brain. And like you say, activating HP access, I come in there already in a deficit and there's just oh, yeah. no way to make it back up. And this is where, you know, and, and we were talking about work situations, but you talk about with your children mm-hmm. or your spouse or, or whatever it is where you go, he or she is not really here. They're like a shell. Exactly. Like 
I kind of wish, uh, you know, I've been in on different boards and different things like that. I kind of wish at the door before you come into the three hour board meeting that we p- could put all the gauges up about what's going on for us. You know, what is the circadian rhythm looking like for this person? You know, how much REM have they been getting? Because I'll know how active their brain will be during this, how creative they'll be. Could I look at their alpha waves before they come in? Because if they have no alpha waves, they're really kind of a waste of a ta- time in here because they're not going to come up with any ideas. Are their theta waves, which have to do with their recovery and sleep, really low? Because I can't tell you how many board meetings I've been in where you know one of the key investors or somebody, I look over and they're sleeping. Like, right. like why are you wasting our time? You know, um, right. you're so spent or you're going so fast that the moment we sat you down in a chair for more than 10 minutes, you did this pendulum thing where you just completely crashed. Or you have the person, the only way they can stay engaged is to keep talking and be impulsive and distracted. And you're like, could you please be quiet and listen to these decisions that we're trying to make that have multi-million dollar impact and impacting thousands of people? Could you please just listen to what's going on? And and I, I just wish before we started all of that stuff, before you come in, can you pull up your dashboard, please? And can <laughs> I kind of look at what's going on in your right. uh, heart rate coherence, the inner beat interval in your heart, what's going on in your breathing right now, what's going on in your brainwave activity? Let me see what your adrenal axis is doing. Let me see what your circadian rhythm is doing. Okay, check, you can come in. Or, <laughs> you know what? Let's right. try this again. Because, you know... Think about relationships, if we could kind of see that with somebody before we had a discussion with them. You know, I'm kind of thinking of like, you know, one of these sci-fi movies where they, you know, they (laughs) pull up the the transparent screen, you know, and it has all the different things, you know, on it. And imagine these are all dials that impact your ability to operate in this moment in time. And reality is, these dials do impact and we have to get those dials. It's just like flying an airplane, mm-hmm. right? Except it may be more important, you know, because yeah. it's somebody's, uh, yes, somebody's life in the airplane, but this is, you're investing this time. And just think of all the things you have to check on that to fly that airplane. But in relationships, we just don't check that stuff. We just assume, you know, everybody's the same. Everybody's not the same. And we need to be looking at those. And I, I think it'd be good for us to go through a few of those dials and kind of talking about well, yeah. what is ideal, yeah, you know, and what's what's not ideal. Let's do it. Okay, so I think the first one would be breathing. Okay, mm-hmm. is respiratory functioning. So we've talked about how important energy is. So if we're gonna, you can't have any discussion about energy without talking about breathing. Impossible. Why? Because ninety nine zero percent of your energy comes from oxygen. Mm-hmm. Just think of the things that you can, that you look at for energy, like food, water, sleep, and then think of oxygen. Oxygen, you take it away for four or five minutes and you'll give up everything that you have for one more breath because you need that for energy. Well, the average person in the United States is breathing about 14 breaths a minute, all from their upper chest, very shallow, sporadic breaths. And the lack of consistency of these breaths and the shallowness and speed of them causes the heart to become very sympathetic, very fast. Right. Because the heart is always looking to the breathing to decide, well, how much work do I have to do right now? And if my breathing is sloppy, which most people in the United States, their breathing is sloppy and it's very stress-based, then it starts a cascade of sympathetic or stress-related activities throughout all my organs, but specifically my heart. So a, a good spot to be is, you know, can I breathe three, four times a day for, for four or five minutes at five to set six breaths a minute in a very even, steady pace where the amplitudes are the same, there's symmetry in that breath. The rate is the same. So the heart can kind of downshift and say, okay, this is, I like 
the way this is coming in versus a fuel line that has a bunch of kinks in it. That's what our breathing looks like many times in the US is, is very like a fuel line instead of it being even, it has all these like kinks in it where the engine is not getting the fuel consistency. And so then it over consistently. So then it, it misfires and all kinds of stuff. So the breathing is a number one, five to six breaths a minute in a way that promotes the cardiovascular to, to work in a certain way. And if you don't know how to do that, it's extremely hard, if not impossible, to get your physiological functioning to be fully present. And what your perception of that is, is probably not accurate if you don't have this breathing style as a base for the rest of the organs in the body. Right on. Okay, what's the next thing on the dashboard then? So the next thing I would go to, I mean, we're going to get to most important ones in the brain, in the brain in a second, but the next one I would go to is the heart because the heart is taking cues from the breathing, okay? And so if you've ever seen an EKG, you'll see these little spikes that happen. Right. And um, and you've seen images of that kind of thing. Those spikes are uh, the uh, interbeat interval between your heart and um, everybody has different uh, span of that interbeat interval. And this contributes to something called coherence in the heart, which is a balancing out of the stress with the recovery responses in the heart. So when you have a pulse of 60, that doesn't mean the heart is beating at 60 all the time. What that is, is an average of all your upbeats that happen in your heart, which those upbeats could be as high as 72, 75, and the downbeats, which are 45. And then when we look at it over a 60 second period of time, that creates a pulse of 60, okay? You can also have somebody who has a pulse of 60, but they have very little variability between those beats. So their upbeats only go as high as 63 and their downbeats only go as low as 57. So that variability is very, very narrow versus the person who has high variability between the beats. Okay. Try not to get too complicated here, but that inner beat interval is really set by the breathing style, the more calm and steady and deep the breath is, the more you'll get greater variability in those beats. Now, it seems counterintuitive. You'd say, well, I don't want greater variability. Well, you actually do. The more variability between your beats, so high beats and low beats, the more you're able to handle stress. Okay, so, so think of something that's like, it's just beating on the same tone every, you know, on the same rhythm every single time. That's okay if the environment never changes. <laughs> if everything's the same and I don't have to deal with anything that re- creates any stress, which is impossible, then the beat being on very close to that 60 every single time works. But because we deal with stress, we need more variability in our beats. It's not just about what our pulse or heart rate is. It's about this variability because that acts like a rubber band with the world around me. The greater variability I have in my interbeats, the more I'm able to, to be resilient and manage things around me and manage changes. Even in a conversation that may get a little heated, you know, or, uh, may move to calm or back. It's moving around. Conversations are, are very active and alive, right. right? And so my heart needs to flex with that. And we've seen this with people. You've seen this, yep. you know, out there is somebody who you just say like one thing and they completely lose it, right? Well, their inner beat interval is very likely super tight. And the moment you put a tiny bit of stress on that inner beat interval, they go into a panic state and they just lose their cool because yep. they have no elasticity. And that's so important if we're talking about being present and working with the ups and downs of relationships yep. that you can have that elasticity in the heart, which comes from the breathing being very accurate and consistent. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And in fact, I'm going to put in a plug here for our book. Because yeah. we talk about this a lot in there and the science of it. 
And, you know, part of it is, is bioengineering and math, which a lot of people, you know, oh my gosh, it's math. But when you go back to how breathing controls or oxygenation controls the heart, right? So with each beat of your heart, you're able to move a volume, however many cc's of blood, right? Based on the size of your heart. And the red blood cells in your heart are carrying oxygen. If there's less red blood cells in each beat, then more beats have to happen to deliver the same volume of oxygen, right? It's like sending out, you know, FedEx delivery trucks half yeah. full. Mm-hmm. And so you have to send more delivery trucks to get the packages there because each truck is half full. So when you're not fully oxygenating in the lungs mm-hmm. because your breathing is shallow, your heart has to work harder. It has to beat faster. So if you're not taking, if you're not breathing properly, your pulse rate will go up because it's math and engineering. And then we also talk, what you're talking about, heart rate variability, which is so counterintuitive because we think, you know, the first time somebody will say, hey, look, my heart rate variability is, I mean, my heart's super consistent. What a good thing. And like you say, it's elasticity or responsiveness. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, all the different things you're mentioning in a conversation or, or the example where you say, hey, I'm, I've got to carry the groceries into the house. or I've got to walk upstairs. I want my heart to be able to respond quickly and then drop down quickly. And that right. kind of elastic responsiveness is really key. And I don't think that a lot of us think about it that way. But what we want to do is have, we, we want our body, our brains and our bodies to be able to shift gears. You know, when you think about, I mean, most people can't drive a manual stick anymore, right? But you don't want to be going up a hill stuck in a high gear, right? Right, Because the engine will just lag. You know, you got to downshift. And conversely, you don't want to be going downhill, you know, stuck in a low gear because you'll blow your engine up. Right. Uh, right. I mean, you, you know, you have to change the gears to, to match the road. And your body has to be responsive and elastic from the brain down through the, you know, your respiratory system, the cardiac system, all of these different systems of your body have to be able to be responsive. And I don't think we think that. We just think, well, we're supposed to be able to just absorb whatever happens. Right. And when you think in relationships, people who are really present and there, they're not just fixated in a certain, you know, style with you. They're ready for anything you throw at them. Yeah. Right? You know, all of a sudden you say, you know, this happened, which is very traumatic or difficult. And they're just, they're right there with you, right? They're walking the walk with you and they're able to flex with that. They're not that, you know, the people that we find it very hard or hard to connect to are those more rigid ones that if we don't stay right on topic, you know, within their interest level and the way that they believe and see the world, we've lost them. And to be present, you have to have really good inner beat interval variability that we talked about. And you'll see that in sports too. The athlete that outlasts the other athlete could have the exact same heart rate, but the one that can make it up in cycling up the mountain when everybody's crashing is the guy that he has so much variability that he doesn't go into crisis mode. His heart is like, I can handle that because I have elasticity. And in being present and being fully here, it involves that elasticity. So much about about the heart is involved in this. You know, we can talk about workplace situations, board meetings or sitting with your boss or your employee or whatever it is. But we think about like being with the kids. So, you know, you take take kids to the park (laughs) and you'll see this. You'll see some dad sitting on a park bench. And he's like looking at his phone or he's like, and as long as the kids just do predictable things and don't sort of, you know, uh, do something that is unpredictable, he's just like, yeah, okay, whatever. But, you know, one kid is going to fall off the jungle gym, another one's going to do this, another one's going to have that. And his ability to sort of match what's going on with them, to engage with what's going on with them, even when it goes in an unexpected direction, kid falls off the Kid falls off the swing set. Other kid has a meltdown. Barking dog comes over. Th- that, that parent that's able to sit there and sort of react to those situations, respond to those situations, 
pay attention to those situations. Mm-hmm. If afterwards you say, how did the kid fall off the swing set? You go, I, I don't know. I really, I, I sort of didn't notice. Right. <laughs> right. Because I exactly. wasn't really watching. And, you know, and I think you see it also at the other end when you see, when you sit with elderly people mm-hmm. and maybe oh, they kind yeah. of drift in and out and you go, are you able to sort of pay attention to them? And so often afterwards, you'll ask somebody, what happened? And you go, I don't really know. It just went sideways or I don't know. I wasn't, I, I didn't see it. So this is where that ability to really be focused and engaged and fully present really matters. But you wanted to talk about the brain a little bit. So, so take us yeah. through that. Yeah. Right before I go to the brain, I want to uh, add a plug here. We've uh, been talking recently about the Inner Armor program, which is available to users. Yep. And a huge part of that program, huge part, is really making the user an expert at the breathing and the, the heart rate variability that we just discussed, which we also refer to as coherence. And you can develop this so quickly through the right technology that you're really changing some of the upstream things. That was just a little plug there for the yeah. program. And if well, you I, ever want, if you want to access it, absolutely. You know, go, go to, to forge, forgearmor.com uh, right? and check. Because yeah, it, it, it allows you to access it really on demand. You yes. learn how to switch into the zone, to switch into that space when you need to. Yeah, fant- it's fantastic. And we built this program, made it very streamlined, very usable, less than 10 minute sessions for users because this is such a huge component to who you are as a person. And it just unleashes all the potential in there. But let's um, kind of go to the last one that, I mean, there's many we can talk about. Oh my goodness, the HPA axis, the hormones, all kinds of stuff. But, but we really uh, wouldn't be doing justice to this if we didn't get to the, the master controller of this, which is the brain. And so the brain runs off of electrical current, okay? And this electricity runs in various speeds, just like a, a car or uh, has different speeds it can go into. And there's 12, there's basically 32 of these different speeds, zero to 32. And the first 12 are primarily there for the brain to rest and recover, okay? If you're stuck in those one of those 12 frequencies or a band of those too much, you'll find that it's very hard to focus. This is kind of that crashing component that we'll see when somebody's been running, 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 and then they crash and fall asleep in the board meeting. If we had an EEG on them, which I'd love to have, I could see ahead of time that brain is starting to drift too much into the slow waves. This person isn't paying attention. Okay, You could see that with an attention disorder. Like I can see it before the person actually behaviorally elicits that behavior. As I can see, uh uh-oh, brain just downshifted into too much theta, four to eight hertz, is not able to focus. I just lost that person. Even though they're looking straight at me, that person is not listening to a word I'm saying because they're engaging too much of the slower brain waves. After we have the slow ones, and those are important because they help us recover, but we don't want to be using those at the wrong time. Okay, we want to primarily be using those when we're sleeping. 12 to 20 hertz is the perfect speed. And really, we would say, we talk about this in the book, is uh, we talk about this uncommon focus that comes out of 12 to 16, 12 to 15 hertz, which is the marathon runner of focus in the brain. I mean, it allows the brain to focus for long periods of time. This is when an athlete is in the zone. It's when you can't miss. It's when you're producing things in the office and you look up and you say, it's only 10 o'clock. Like I just did eight hours of work in two hours. What in the heck happened? That's that flow state. And that is an actual measurable thing that we can see in the brain. And when the brain is dominated by 12 to 15, 12 to 16 Hertz, it will be super productive. And it'll also be very calm and focused, which is at the core. It's the bedrock of being present. If somebody doesn't have volumes of 12 to 16, they can try all they want to be present, but they will never get to that 70%, 80% ability to be present because the brain is not engaged. It can't be engaged at the level that we want it to for long periods of time unless it's in that frequency. 
Then comes the last band of frequencies, which is 20 to 32. And these would be called the high betas. There's other frequencies in the brain, but just for the purpose of this discussion, this is where the brain has this built-in mechanism to be able to handle the changes, situations that may come our way that are unpredictable. These are the stress response brainwaves. These are the the ambulance drivers, you know, the EMTs of the brain, 20 and 32. And they're there to help you run from lions, to help you deal with, you know, bullets coming over the foxhole. The reason that uh, they're helpful for that is they activate our adrenaline and they bring in extra sources of energy that can get us out of difficult situations. Many of us learn through really bad habits to hack these fast brain waves to get normal activities done. And that's how we work our way up the ladder or, you know, complete the, the, uh, studying for the exam at the last minute and all these different things is by hacking these fast brainwaves and using them for something they really weren't meant to be used for. They can be very productive, but there's a cost. You can't just burn that much energy that you was reserved to run from a lion. Uh, and you just used it, you know, the first four hours of your day just to get through your day. And you and you made it go a little faster with adding some more caffeine to it because that'll make it go faster too. And now you're crashing because the body can't do that. So, Doc, I, I want you to wear two hats here. You, you've, you've been describing this in the last minute or two from a neurophysiological standpoint. But as a psychologist, when you have gotten by mm-hmm. and you maybe you've, quote unquote, succeeded in some parts of your life by treating everything as a crisis, right? Because that's what you're really saying. It's like, right. you know, uh, I don't know if I'm going to coin a word here, but crisifying everything, Yeah, uh, <laughs> right? So, you know, the way, that I, the way that I get stuff done is by shifting into crisis mode. And I've learned how to do that. So now I'm treating things that really are sort of normal life tasks as crises. Right. But then, now we've talked, you, you've talked about the neurophysiological, physiological effects of that, but, but talk about the psychological effects where I've sort of like from a, a operant conditioning standpoint taught myself to treat everything as a crisis or to think of everything as a crisis or to think that the best way to function in life is to, is to, sh- is, is to be in crisis mode. What does that do to somebody psychologically over time? Yes, yeah, psychologically, it's going to produce a ton of anticipatory anxiety, stress, could develop into clinical disorders like not being able to sleep at night, um, which, you know, we should be able to do obsessive compulsive disorder, panic attacks. Your head is kind of on a swivel all the time. Like you, you're, you're looking, trying to look 360 degrees all the time because you don't know what's coming at you. And yes, that keeps you activated in a focused way, but it's a stress focused. Like when somebody darts out in front of me when I'm driving my car, I become extremely focused. Okay. But when that event is over with and I miss the kid or whatever, you know, I want to eat three Snickers bars, right? Right. Right. Because I like, I burned so much energy to be focused and that's not going to last for a three hour board meeting or in a conversation with my wife. If that's how I'm trying to focus, that is high frequency focus which will kill you and create chronic illness versus low frequency focus. Okay. I want you to think about or reflect on what this does to your relationships. So you've got an individual who takes what really are ordinary life tasks or challenges and approaches each one of them as a five alarm fire. So this is the person who's like, I have to pack the car for the vacation. And I'm going to treat packing the car so we can leave on a trip as a crisis, like we're going to the moon. And it's like, you know, failure is not an option. We have to do this and this, that. And they're they're (laughs) snapping and they're yelling at family members. So by the time the family gets in the car to leave for the trip, it's already fractured. I mean, nobody's having fun. Or you think about the parent who goes to the kid's soccer game or whatever. Right. Yeah. And is on the sideline. And the little kids are running up and down and there's a foul or maybe a bad referee call or whatever. And this parent is over there treating this like it's a, you know, bad call in the Super Bowl that's going to cost millions of dollars and starts yelling at the ref and yelling at the coach and other parents can become alienated. The kid is embarrassed, right? And, and so, but some of these people are like, well, that's how I do stuff. I mean, I've been with people 
who were at the airport and our flight is delayed by 30 minutes because of weather or whatever. And they're, they're going off on the, on the gate attendant, <laughs> yes. right? And I'm yeah. like, what do you, what, what, you know, and now it becomes embarrassing for me to be traveling with this person. So right. talk a little bit about that person. Cause I think the value of presence, right? Maybe is partly that you uh, not only are engaged with the people around you and the things going on, but you're in a sense like matching their level. Does that make sense? So that you're all like, yes. you know, on the same, they're all sort of singing on the same page in the hymnal. Yeah. I think what happens is your awareness is up is, is you have greater awareness of your own personal senses. You know, what am I feeling, experiencing, going on? How do I need to calm down? How do I need to engage my breathing? So your self-awareness is up. Your awareness of the situation is up because you're not using all this high frequency lion chasing. Like when I'm, if I'm running from a lion, I don't really care what time of the day it is. I don't care what's going on in the stock market. I don't care what's going on in any area of my life. I am running from that lion, right? And in the process, you know, I could make a mess of everything around me, but I'm going to run from the lion. And that's what happens with these people that are stuck up in high frequency focus is everything becomes chaos in order for them to this life and death situation, which is not a life and death situation. That is what you're constructing it to be in your brain. And if you would conserve that energy, okay, so I've, I've spent, you know, just think of like, I have a battery, right? And I've now opened 40 apps on my phone. They're all running at the same time. That's every system in your body. And I need some energy to focus on the people in the situation. What's going on myself? That energy is not available because I just spent it on useless what ifs this happens. Well, uh, anticipatory stress. Well, even to sort of, you know, <laughs> apply an old joke here, right? I mean, in, if, if we're running from a lion, uh, I don't really have to be faster than the lion. I just have to be faster than you. Right? Exactly. And my strategy is going to be to trip you. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and let the lion eat you so I can escape. But I mean, to use that, that old joke, but at the same thing, when it becomes destructive of relationships, because when we're running from the lion, I'm not thinking about you. No. And, and so what ends up happening is people who live with or work with people that treat everything as a crisis, that aren't engaged fully with where they are and what they're doing because they're in this other state it becomes destructive of those relationships. It be, you know, how many people have you heard in your office over the years who say it's really hard to live with this person or work with this person? Right. And that's because the upstreams, things that we can measure, that's what I want our listeners to know. These are measurable, okay? The way that most medicine deals with a lot of these things is just rate these things or tell me, you know, like how are most people diagnosed with ADHD? with a subjective or attention problem, a subjective checklist of things, right? But you can literally measure attention in the brain. Uh, I, you got to understand that this is all available for people. You can see your dashboard. And it's so interesting when you sit down with people and one, when you sit down with the iconic people, the number one in the world in tennis nine times, and you look at their brain, you're like, there is not one lion chasing brainwave activated in this person at all. I mean, literally, when you look at the normal population, this person's in the 0.001% of using lion chasing brainwaves to function. And why does that person act differently at Wimbledon and win it so many times? Because they're able to be fully present, literally there when the ball hits the racket versus their brain someplace else in the worried situation. And then I've been on the flip side where, you know, the, the executive comes in and I'm like, man, I, I, I'm like the coolest customer. And I look at their brain, and I'm like, what kind of destruction are you causing along the way? Because you're so unaware, unaware because you're in high frequency focus all the time. Your breathing is so fast. Your inner beat interval is so tight. There is no way that the people around you are sensing any form of connection or presence. Even though you might feel like that's going on, you're robbing yourself 
of really being the, the true you that you could be if we could get these upstream behaviors or these upstream measurable neurological and physiological things under control to address the psychological, emotional, and ultimately behavioral and relational things. Okay. So as we wind down this episode, I want you to give advice to two categories of people. Uh, sure. Kind of last word here. And the first is advice to the person who either knows or suspects that maybe they're that guy or they're that ga gal, they're that person, and that they aren't really engaged or present. What do they do? They need to get an assessment and get their dashboard in front of them. Okay, they're flying their airplane with no dials. They don't know what altitude. They don't know what speed. They don't know anything going on. And they're just making havoc of their life. So get the dashboard. They just don't, see. Yeah, they don't just need a vacation or a hobby. No, they need to see what is going on. I mean, you're doing all this work and you're, you're trying to move the needle in maybe work or life or whatever. But you're burning in such a way that you're literally creating chronic illness. You're creating dementia. You're creating sleep problems. You're creating type 2 diabetes, obesity. These things are happening as reflections of you not managing the dashboard. So just get an assessment and figure out what you're, what's going on. And then, I mean, we have great programs. We have the Royer Neuroscience Concierge Program where you get paired with a a coach, and you have access to about $7,000 worth of technology that you use to read yourself all the time. You have the Inner Armor Program, which is 10 minutes or less, uh, three or four times a week. I mean, we have the resources for you. Or maybe you just need to educate yourself more and, you know, um, you know, Forge Your Inner Armor, you know, our book is great, a good place to start. Okay. Yeah. And here's the, the last piece of advice to the second category person. What if you live with or work with somebody who's not present um, or is mm -hmm. not present enough uh, and it's just making you miserable to be around this person who's not engaged? What, what advice do you have? I mean, as, as 30 years of psych, as a psychologist, neuropsychologist, what advice do you have for that person? That person is go back to yourself and upstream enhance, even though you already might be a calm, steady person, enhance your neurological functioning, enhance the breathing, enhance your sleeping, get your uh, cardiovascular working super well, and you will solve that situation. Okay, you can be in those crisis situations, real life crisis situation with that person and internally be in control of what's going on if you can master those things. That's we, when we work with special forces, they're in, they're in lion chasing situations. Right. You know, there's gunfire going on, but they're able to control all these things and actually be creative and innovative and problem solve in very difficult, difficult situations. And that's upstream. And what's very interesting is I've had people that I've worked with in situations that are, you know, toxic, that uh, we were work we might be working on something else, like their sleep or their focus. And the next thing I know, they make this huge choice in this relationship to get out of this abusive relationship that they've been in for 22 years, or to make a change in their job, or to do something innovative in relation to how they're dealing with their boss. And I'm like, you know where that came from? Your brain solved that problem for you because we, we opened it up. We opened up the creativity to do that. So your brain will come up with the solution. It's the most amazing thing that exists in the entire universe. And you just have to use it. You have to, you have to hone it and get it in shape and it will do its thing. Fantastic advice, Doc. Well, thanks. And uh, we're going to come back and talk a little bit more about presence and particularly the things that rob us of presence in terms of the ways that we isolate ourselves. So that'll be the next episode. So join us for that. But in the meantime, folks, go to forgeinnerarmor.com. Uh, there's a contact form there. You can check there and uh, leave a message and somebody will get back to you and you can get an assessment, learn more about the programs 
Also go to Amazon.com. You can get the book Forge Inner Armor by Dr. Timothy Royer and uh, available in print, ebook, and audiobook. So join us next time and subscribe to the podcast. This has been the Inner Armor Podcast. You can find it wherever you get your podcasts. Would you please follow or subscribe and make sure to leave us a review or comment. You can learn more about Inner Armor, Dr. Royer, and how to perform at your potential by going to forgeinnerarmor.com.